abortion, spin, and reality. There are several things that uh, have been claimed, and we're going to look at them in some depth about abortion. Uh, one argument is that abortion is morally permissible because a woman has a right to do what she wants to do with her own body. One is that uh, abortion is morally permissible if the fetus is too undeveloped to feel pain. One is that abortion should be, in the words of Bill Clinton, safe, legal, and rare. Uh, one is if we about, uh, outlaw abortions, they will become dangerous. We'll see the return of back alley abortions. One is if abortion is legally permissible, then abortion, abortion is morally permissible. Uh, one is kind of the converse of that, almost. If abortion is morally impermissible, then abortion should be legally impermissible. That there is, in one of these two, some kind of tie between legal permission and moral permission. And finally, Abortion is morally wrong because it kills the fetus. And we're going to go through all of these and look at them uh, in some depth. First, uh, does a woman have a right to her own body? The Gosnell case has horrified the nation. The grand jury report handing down indictments against Kermit Gosnell, MD, and several members of his staff for multiple crimes, including eight murders, and I might add that most of them have now pleaded guilty. Uh, Kermit Gosnell is the only one that's been doing abortions anyway that is still defending his uh, uh, course of action. And it's probably noteworthy to note that the defense did not call any witnesses. Um, the grand jury case reports something that's kind of interesting. Cross was not the only one startled by the size and maturity of baby boy A, for which he is being tried for murder. Adrian Moten and Ashley Baldwin, along with Cross, these are two of his assistants, um, took photographs because they knew this was a baby that sh could and should have lived. Cross explained, uh, questioner in the grand jury, why did you take, I'll take a photograph of this baby. She said, because it was big and it was wrong and we knew it. We knew something was wrong. These are people who do abortions every day, so abortion isn't the issue here. The issue is, this is a baby that could have lived. This isn't a woman controlling her own body. This is a woman controlling the baby's body after it's born, or more precisely, the abortion doctor um, controlling it because she came to him. Uh, this is, um, again, not an abortion-friendly paper. Uh, the Gosnell trial has shifted the focus off of the high-quality services we provide, says Dale Steinberg, the organizations that is Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania, president and chief executive. These are criminal, horrendous acts and should be appropriately punished. Notice that an abortion provider ahead of Planned Parenthood, in fact, in this particular area, is willing to say that whatever is happening at Planned Parenthood, Gosnell was wrong. Now, of course, there has been some equivocation because in other areas, Planned Parenthood has, in fact, lobbied for precisely what Gosnell did. Um, you'll notice that um, Elisa Lapointe Snow was opposing a, a proposal that's Planned Parenthood uh, in Florida that would require a doctor to provide care for an infant, infant whom an abortion failed to kill. Lawmakers were stunned, asking the same question over and over. So is it just really hard for me to even ask you this question because I'm almost in, pardon me, it is, because I'm almost in disbelief, said Representative Jim Boyd. If a baby is born on a table as a result of a boss botched abortion, what would Planned Parenthood want to have happen to that child that is struggling for life? And 
or, uh, LePoint Snow's comment, we believe that any decision that's made should be left up to the woman, her family, and the physician. With no oversight in case the physician snips the neck, I guess. The same or very similar questions followed several times as if lawmakers could not believe the position advocated. You stated the baby born alive on a table is a, a result of a botched abortion, but that decision should be left to the doctor and the family. Is that what you're saying? I uh, wondered, uh, Representative Jose Oliva, um, Oliva, Snow didn't change her response. That decision should be between the patient and the health care provider. When one lawmaker suggested that at that point the patient also would include the newborn, Snow responded, that's a very good question. I would be glad to have some more conversation with you about this. Now, one may object to the, I think this is World Not Daily, but um, they have the video of her answering the questions in just that way. And of course, Barack Obama was recommending against a law in Illinois, which was essentially the same as the federal law, that said that if there's a baby born as a result of a botched abortion, you'd have to get a, another physician involved. And um, in opposing it, Barack Obama, who was at that time a state senator, said, let me just go to the bill very quickly. I think as this emerged during debate and during committee, the only plausible rationale to my mind for this legislation would be if you had a suspicion that a doctor, the attending physician, who has made an assessment that this is a non-viable fetus, and that, let's say, for the purposes of the mother's health is being that, that labor is being induced, that that physician a, is going to make the wrong assessment, and B, if the physician discovered after the labor had been induced that in fact he made an error or she made an error, and in fact that that physician of his own accord or of her own accord would not try to exercise the sort of medical measures and practices that would be involved in saving that child. Well, that's exactly what the Gosnell did. And in fact, in Illinois, there was testimony that Physicians were leaving those babies to die, literally. They weren't snipping the necks. They were just letting them cry for the next eight hours or whatever without any assistance. And uh, whenever they died, they died, and that was it. And this was exactly what the legislation was intending to prevent. Baby, once it's born, is now a baby. It is now no longer part of the mother and there's no reason for not doing, uh, not taking care of it. Now, if, if you think that there are possibilities that doctors would not do that, and there is testimony to that effect, then maybe this bill makes sense. But I, I suspect, and my impression is that the medical society suspects as well, the doctors feel they would be under that ob obligation. That is, that the abortion doctor would have to save the baby if possible. And they would already be making these discriminations that essentially adding, a, adding an additional doctor who then has to be called in an emergency situation to come in and make these assessments is really designed simply to burden the original decision of the woman and the physician to induce labor and perform an abortion. Now, if that's the case, and I know that some of us feel very strongly one way or another on that issue, that's fine. But I think it's important to understand that this issue ultimately is about abortion and not live births. Because if these children are being born alive, I at least have confidence that a doctor who's in that room is going to make sure that they're looked after. Raises an interesting question of what looked after means. Gosnell certainly looked after his uh, babies as they were born. But I'm not sure that's quite what uh, most people have in mind. Now, in all fairness to Obama, he's right. The legislation, if implemented, would destroy at least late-term abortion for a very simple reason. Supposing a 29-week-old baby survives but has cerebral palsy. At 18 years old, he or she could sue the abortion clinic provider and the clinic 
for everything they have. And with the appropriate uh, John Edwards style lawyer, could probably get it. The late abortion industry is in fact dependent on nobody surviving. That's why you have benign neglect in some places and snipping in others, is because you can't let that baby live. That's why an abortionist cannot be required to have a consultation if the baby is born alive, because if it's somebody else's judgment, yes, we could save that baby. The abortionist says, no, it's not going to make it. And the other guy is right. The abortionist is open for huge lawsuits. Late-term abortion, in fact, has nothing to do with a woman's wanting to control her own body. It has to do with wanting the baby dead. If she wanted to control her own body, deliver the baby, give it up for adoption, no problem. And in fact, in California, you can walk up to any hospital, hand the baby through the window, and walk away. And they are not allowed to question you as to your medical history, as to anything. But what's happening is people are trying to get rid of the baby. So when somebody says abortion is morally permissible because a woman has a right to what she wants with her own body, it's frankly spin. And at least in the case of late-term abortions, it is flat out false. And frankly, I think one of the reasons why the Gosnell trial is being ignored is because people are afraid that people will realize that it's false and that it's spin and they will lose credibility, which in my humble opinion they should. What about but if we do this, we have back alley abortions and you know, it's, we're going to go back to the old days when people use coat hangers and people ruptured uteruses and all that stuff. Again, to go back to the philly.com article, Steinberg said that when Gosnell was in practice, women would sometimes come to Plant Parenthood for services after first visiting Gosnell's West Philadelphia clinic and would complain to staff about the conditions there. We would always encourage them to report it to the Department of Health, Steinberg said, as she sat with Steinem before Tuesday's events. Always? Uh, and you know how much good that did. People died. And everybody ignored what was going on. I'm not talking about babies now. I'm talking about mothers. Again, from the grand jury report on Gosnell, Stalowski, who was in the department that was supposed to inspect these facilities, blamed the decision to abandon supposedly annual inspections of abortion clinics on Department of Health lawyers, who, she said, changed their legal opinions and advice to suit the policy preferences of different governors. Uh, interesting uh, comment on the uh, integrity of the lawyers. Under Governor Robert Casey, who's a Democrat, by the way, pro-life, uh, pro um, she said, the department inspected abortion facilities annually. Yet when Governor Tom Ridge came in, Republican pro-choice, the attorneys interpreted the same regulations that had permitted annual inspections for years to no longer authorize those, those inspections. Want a different opinion? Just tell them what the opinion you want. Then only complaint-driven inspections supposedly were authorized, although those weren't done either. Stalowski said that the Department of Health's policy during Governor Ridge's administration was motivated by a desire not to be, quote, putting up a barrier to women seeking abortions. Now think about this. What that means is the inspections were, in fact, not done because if they were done, it might impede women's access to abortion. 
doesn't that say that the abortion industry is substandard and can't stand the inspections? Isn't that what it precisely says? And uh, following the next paragraph in the uh, uh, grand jury report, Brody confirmed some of what Stolowski told the grand jury. He described a meeting of high-level government officials in 1999 at which a decision was made not to accept a recommendation to reinstitute regular inspections of abortion clinics. The reasoning, as Brody recalled, was, quote, there was a concern that if they did routine inspections, they might find a lot of these facilities didn't meet the standards. That's their insertion, by the way for getting patients out, of stretch, out by stretcher or wheelchair in an emergency, uh, close their insertion. And then there would be less abortion facilities, less access to women to have an abortion. So they knew that the facilities were substandard. And uh, according to the Washington Times, this isn't just re uh, restricted to Gosnell's clinic. Abortions have been suspended at a Delaware Planned Parenthood. This is actual Planned Parenthood itself. After several 911 calls made from within the clinic prompted a new investigation by Health and Human Services. And uh, they're quoting one of the nurses there, or uh, one of the ex-nurses there that quit. I couldn't tell you how ridiculously unsafe it was, she said. Quote, Speaking of another doctor, he didn't wear gloves. He didn't believe he needed to wear them. Planned Parenthood needs to close its doors if it needs to be, it needs to be cleaned up. The staff needs to be trained. Now, I want you to notice something. This is not somebody who has finally become converted to the idea of no abortions. You notice it needs to be cleaned up. The staff needs to be trained so that they can go back to the business again, but this time doing it right. What that says is, this is somebody who's witnessing procedures that even pro-abortion people find repugnant. And then the comment of uh, Mary Peterson from the Delaware Department of Health and Human Services. I'm not going to lie to you. We don't have the manpower to do routine inspections. We're not putting enough money into inspecting these facilities to just simply assure that they're half decent. She told the station her investigators went into the facility in October of last year after complaint but didn't find anything. And then all of a sudden five people had emergencies. Since January, four or five patients have been rushed to the emergency department, X in news reports, and that's why the clinic was shut down. It wasn't because people complained that this is a, a horrible operation. They were using tools just like Gosnell did without sterilizing them. Um, and uh, there's a very interesting passage. Um, this is the Daily Beast, which again is uh, largely pro-abortion. The Gosnell case came up repeatedly when Pennsylvania's General Assembly was debating a law that put stricter requirements on abortion clinics. Notice what they're holding them to. The same standards as outpatient surgery centers. Wouldn't you think that was the minimum standard? They are doing outpatient surgery, aren't they? which must have a wider, do wider doors and elevators that can accommodate a stretcher. Critics said the law, supported by Pennsylvania's pro-life governor, Tom Corbin, did little to increase patient safety. Of course, we know the one case where a um, patient very well may have died be partly because of that particular problem. Didn't I hear somebody say about gun regulations once that if only one life is saved, it would be worth it? And resulted in clinics shutting down because they couldn't afford to make the upgrades. How many clinics? 
now that the law is in effect, there are five fewer clinics in the state for a total of 17. That's five out of 22. If you count Gosnell's clinic, that's six out of 23. That's over a quarter of the clinics. This is just, I, I mean, if you took the premise at face value, you would say these people are cheating. We already have what are the equivalent of back alley abortions. The argument that if we allow abortions, they will become more dangerous is spin and in all probability is false. We don't quite have enough numbers from before and after to say for absolute dead sure, but I think that the, the, it's definitely against the evidence that we do have. Well, what about um, fetuses can't feel pain, so abortion is okay as long as they don't feel the pain. Well, fetuses react like they feel pain, at least later. In fact, there have been some cases where ultrasounds have been done while somebody's trying to perform an abortion, and you can see the little baby acting like it's trying to get away. The question that I have is, is it wrong to kill puppies? Do puppies feel pain? Well, what about newborn babies? Is it wrong to kill newborn babies? If it's wrong to kill newborn babies, even if they're 30 weeks, then isn't it wrong to kill fetuses at 30 weeks? What, what is this thing about pain anyway? Supposing that you wanted to murder somebody and so you gave them a little ether and put them off to a nice dreamlike sleep and then slit their um, uh, juggler veins, is that uh, morally permissible because they don't feel pain? Well, let's make it even nicer, okay? We're not gonna make the relatives feel pain. The patient has heart disease. So you give them an anesthetic and then you give them a little um, an infusion of adenosine or something else to make the coronary arteries constrict to bring on a heart attack. It happens in their sleep, they never wake up. The other people who are around you don't realize that the patient didn't just have a heart attack, he had a pre-planned heart attack. Is that moral? Should that be legal? Now, I'm not saying that because babies can feel pain that therefore abortions are wrong. But what I'm saying is the excuse that abortions are right because they don't feel pain is a really shallow excuse. Is it justified to kill somebody because they don't have any pain nerves? A person with leprosy can't feel any pain. Say so you kill. The fact of the matter is that the idea that abortion is morally permissible if the fetus is too undeveloped to feel pain is faulty and invalid. It may still be justified, but you're going to have to justify it on other bases. That's what I mean by invalid. What about abortions should be safe, legal, and rare? You hear this all the time. Frankly, legal seems to be the only interest of abortion providers. They want it to be legal all the way down. In fact, you heard until Gosnell came along, a Planned Parenthood, actually Gosnell had come along. He, the indictment had been handed out. But they were still arguing until the Gosnell trial started and everybody started knowing what was being done. Um, Planned Parenthood was arguing that um, the baby came out, you know, whatever the mother and the doctor wanted to do, presumably the doctor because the mother's anas under anesthesia, should be okay. But if we were talking about safe, then why the objection to annual inspections? 
isn't the point of being safe that you make sure that the ambulance can get to the facility if there's something goes wrong? Shouldn't people be upset if, uh, let's say, resuscitation equipment isn't there? If untrained people are, oh, they are upset. Well, it turns out that a lot of facilities are substandard. Even if you accept abortion as a good idea, they're substandard. And yet nobody seems to be pushing to let's make sure our house is clean so that when, when people uh, look at uh, abortion, they, they think uh, that it's a proper thing to do. What about rare? Well, again, WGRZ.com, this is, of course, a TV station. Excluding miscarriages, nearly 60% of pregnancies among 15 to 19-year-olds in New York end in abortion. That's not exactly rare, is it? Okay, well that's according to the Guttmacher uh, Institute, uh, Guttmacher Institute analysis. So they're, they're just biased. Well, let's hear from the other side. They're going to object to those figures, of course. No, Tara Sweeney, spokesman for Narell Pro Choice of New York, said the state's relatively high abortion rate should not be used as an excuse to restrict abortion rights as a factor in women's decisions. They're accepting. The statistics. The statistics, in fact, are not in dispute. As NewYorkMagazine.com pointed out, again, not noted to be a conservative bastion, in parts of the city, uh, if I recall correctly, the Bronx is one of them, uh, the ratio of abortions to births in everybody, not just in the kids, is one to one. Actually, a little bit higher. Think about that. What are we talking about? Safe, legal, and rare. Frankly, that line is pure You can supply the adjective. <coughs> what about Abortion is legal, so therefore abortion should be moral. Well, smoking is legal. Nobody argues that it is therefore moral. At one time, slavery was legal. Nobody argues now that it, sh it was moral because it was legal. In Germany, it was not only legal but mandated that Jews should be reported to authorities. That didn't make it moral. Adventists in particular, I think, should be very careful of making these kinds of arguments. The idea if abortion is legally permissible, then abortion is moral, morally permissible, is a very faulty argument, and I think that uh, one cannot put any significant weight on it. Well, what about if, remember the converse, of course, or more, more precisely the inverse of it, is that if abortion is morally impermissible, then abortion should be legally, or is legally impermissible which of course won't work. And um, if you, well, maybe we should modify that. If mor abortion is morally impermissible, then abortion should be legally impermissible as well. Um, that's a little stickier than the last one. Should we work to make all immorality illegal? Should we have worked for prohibition? Maybe yes, maybe no. I think most people are stopped have stopped working for it. What about making tobacco illegal? Uh, what about making marijuana illegal? What about premarital sex, short skirts, jewelry, playing cards, gambling? And that includes the 10 cent bets that people make on the Super Bowl. What about lying about one's age? What about coffee? What about attending a theologically faulty church? Maybe um, work on Sunday should be illegal. Maybe uh, work on Saturday should be illegal. I'm not sure that we can make that connection either direction. Now, 
There is some plausibility. I'm glad that killing is illegal. Um, and uh, frankly, I'm glad that uh, Gosnell is uh, being tried, and I hope that if the facts are as alleged, that he's convicted. But I think that uh, we need to be really careful about making an ironclad case in that particular direction. And finally, we come to one that's um, a little stickier. Abortion is morally wrong because it kills the fetus. I think it's the most attractive of the statements yet, but I think that as we will see, it has some major flaws. One of them is not all killing is considered murder. For example, if somebody starts shooting at you, you happen to have a gun lying around and you shoot back at them and you kill them, that's considered killing in self-defense. And it's not legally murder. And one of the things we need to keep in mind is that the debate is not just about morality, it's also about legality. Um, Killing in self-defense, I, I think that given that principle, it should be legally permissible, certainly, and you can make a good argument that it's morally permissible. Uh, in fact, in this particular case, I think you can make a, uh, you can't make a good argument that it's morally impermissible to abort a baby that is threatening the life of the mother and cannot make it without her. The best example I can give is an ectopic pregnancy little tiny fetus stuck in the tube, and when it grows big enough, the mother's going to bleed to death, and the baby's going to be lost too. And getting rid of that baby is perfectly legitimate, and I think even the Catholic Church has come around to that. The question is, if, if all products of conception from the moment they are a zygote, are sacred, then what do you do with a triple, trophoblastic tumor? I think Adventists have difficulty with the soul argument. As soon as you get a zygote, there is a soul that goes in, and then at that point you can't, can't touch it. And um, I think that it's fair to say that the slippery slope argument is real. You know, if, uh, if you're going to approve of abortions at a very early age, then why not approve of abortions all the way along? Um, I think it cuts both ways. In fact, if you start saying that uh, third trimester abortions are not moral, then what's to stop you at late second trimester, at early tri second trimester? When do we start saying that it is moral? And that is why I think some of abortion proponents oppose any restriction to abortion, be it ever so reasonable, simply because they're afraid that this is going to go backwards. I think they got caught with their pants down in Gosnell with infanticide. Is there any logical place to draw a line? Um, there may be. The first, uh, the first question I want to ask is, does every collection of cells that can eventually become a human being have a right to life? Well, I think that depends. What about frozen embryos? They're sitting there in the freezer. Now, I believe in respect for those things. And I think that I, I have a little trouble with people producing you know, 50, 60 frozen embryos so that they can get one kid and uh, then the rest of them can stay frozen until, I guess, the refrigerator quits and then, then they all die. But on the other hand, if we have 50 extra embryos, do we grab the next 50 women and say, you get to take this one and you get to take that one? Notice that you don't have to grab the men to do that. Um, and so you're going to have to carry that baby until it either dies or comes out, one of the two. I think that that's 
really stretching it. That an individual woman does not become responsible, responsible for an individual fetus until, at the bare minimum, it's attached. I think that if a woman gets raped, it is permissible to do to try to get rid of the sperm, and if it accidentally happens to get rid of a zygote instead, it's no big deal. That it doesn't, you don't really re become totally responsible until after the baby is attached. And I finally point out that if you draw the line at fertilization, how do you enforce that? Whereas if you draw the line at implantation, you have a very convenient way of for enforcing it. That is to say, the pregnancy test turns positive. Once that happens, you just stuck with the baby. Now, what's wrong with aborting an embryo that has maybe 30 cells and has no brain to feel pain? Well, I think the problem is we're looking in the wrong direction. The problem really is that the worst damage is not to the zygote, the embryo, or the fetus, but rather to the person aborting the fetus. And this is why it's irrelevant whether the fetuses feel pain or not. We know what we're doing. Now, technically that would make abortion what's sometimes called a victimless crime. I mean, after all, since the fetus doesn't count, why, we're just protecting people from themselves. But so is murder that's done skillfully enough that everyone is fooled into thinking that it is natural and done while the victim is asleep, right? And yet we still prosecute that. Notice how abortionists behave in general. They're you know, I, I can only speak about my own experience and what I've read. And what I've read is the disquieting. My own experience is that abortion clinics are unique in surgery facilities. You call up any other doctor and you say, you know, I have a patient of yours and, and he's bleeding from the tonsils and they're always willing to say, well, here's what you should do with him. And they've got somebody on call 24 hours. You ever try that with an abortion clinic? in the emergency department, doesn't happen. Does not happen, nobody's on call. They're not about to help you. Look at what happens to policemen who kill someone who is thought to deserve it. Now this is somebody who's shooting at them. And you know what happens now? They give them off for about six weeks or so to allow them to kind of recover from the trauma of having actually killed somebody. There is something that happens to people when they kill somebody and they know. And the fact of the matter is, when one does something unnatural like this, one either becomes devastated or hardened. Frankly, I'd prefer they be devastated, but uh, a lot of them get hardened and then they can just do whatever they want to do. And Gosnell thought it was just perfectly normal to not only snip babies' necks if they came out, but to hire people who didn't know what they were doing to tell them to give whatever they wanted to to these people in terms of medicines, uh, to sell drugs on the side. It hardens you. Now, I think that there should be graduated punishment. I think the further along one is, the worse the punishment should be. Now, of course, this is my ideal at 95% viability, and that changes with time. Uh, the act should be considered murder, full-blown murder, whether in the womb or out of the womb doesn't matter. I think that a woman should not be legally responsible for an embryo until it implants. Now, whether morally or not is a different question. That, by the way, gives a week after intercourse for preventive measures to be used. So the argument of, well, what if she's raped, will fall by the wayside. It gets rid of that objection. If a woman doesn't want the baby, I think she should give it up for adoption. It's no problem. There are plenty of people who want babies. And finally, that kind of a procedure is enforceable by pregnancy tests. 
You take a pregnancy test, you're positive, sorry, it's time to quit. The baby's already t attached to you. Now, morally, one may want to be more conservative personally, and the law would not prevent this. I think that the danger to the mother would ha have to pass the test of physical danger. That is, I would just feel bad, or I wouldn't get to the college of my choice is not a good enough reason to abort a baby, legally, and I think certainly morally. I, that's the law that I would advocate. It has fairly clear delineating features. Now, my own personal behavior would probably be more conservative than that. Um, I think some pap people's behavior would be even more conservative than mine, and I might politely disagree with them, but I think that we could probably live with each other much better than people who are living with um, the present system. The law that I just advocated may never be passed, and it may never be enforced if it is passed, and in fact, in the end, all laws may be futile without conversion. And so we may find that no matter what we do, uh, the problem will persist. I think in a world of sin, that's likely. Uh, but I think that the present situation in the United States is definitely not ideal. And if reasonably possible, should be changed. Now, that's my take, but I have one more thing to add. Uh, that is to say, abortion is, uh, I forgot this slide, abortion is morally wrong because it kills the fetus. I think it's plausible, but I think it's wrong. Abortion is wrong primarily because of what it does to the people who do the procedure itself and to the people who get it done on them. My final point involves the Hippocratic Oath. Now, I'm going to give a translation that's presumably not biased because it's from Wikipedia. Uh, first section is to swear by all the gods that there are. Uh, for us, it would be the Almighty, and that would be good enough, I think. Um, that I'm going to skip over the first part, which has to do with uh, taking care of your own. I will prescribe regimens for the good of my patients according to my ability and my judgment and never do harm to anyone. Obviously, that's to the ability that one has. Uh, no doctor can ever say that they never harm anyone. But we never intentionally harm people. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked. And if you're curious about the Greek word behind that, it's pharmakos, which you may recognize. Um, nor suggest any such counsel. And similarly, I will not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. Right there in the Hippocratic Oath, it recognizes that fetal life is life as well. But I will preserve the purity of my life and my arts. That's how you preserve it. Now, go on. I'm going to leave out the part that says you don't do procedures for which you have no training. And to go on to say, in every house where I come, I will enter only for the good of my patients, keeping myself far from all intentional ill-doing and, and all seduction, and especially from the pleasures of love. Aphro uh, Aphrodite comes into that Greek part. Uh, with women or men, be they free or slaves. Notice, it doesn't matter what kind of society, uh, what their station in society, what their sex is, I will not have intercourse with them. Um, all that may come to my knowledge in the exercise of my profession or in the daily commerce with men, which ought not to be spread abroad, I will keep secret and never reveal. Now I want you to notice what's being sworn. Besides that I won't do things I'm not trained for and that I'll take care of my profession. They are, I won't kill anybody, I won't have sex with anybody, and it won't spread people's confidences around. That is to say, you know, the last part is, of course, just simply swearing that this is what I will do and may God treat me the way I treat others. Physicians were safe people to come to. You go to a physician and he won't lie. He won't even spread the truth that you would find embarrassing. He won't he won't try to seduce you. He will even, in fact, re resist your efforts at seduction, no matter your station in life. 
and he will not kill, not even unborn children. You are safe with a physician. Now this is contrast with the uh, pharmacoists, the people who sold <coughs> drugs. If you want a potion to kill your grandmother, fine with me. Here, this is what it is, you know, give me five dollars. Uh, actually more like a shekel, but whatever. You know, <clears throat> they were condemned to the lake of fire. Uh, you're going, what? I never read that in the Bible. Well, here it is. Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, there's that word pharmacois, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake of that which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Pretty strong condemnation. Now, to be fair, pharmacy also had kind of the, uh, the implication of sorcery as well. In those days, you know, you gave somebody and something and it magically made them sick. And so there wasn't quite the distinction that we have now. Uh, and of course, pharmacists have, um, shall we say, grown in their ethics in the meantime. And I hate to say it, but uh, some doctors have uh, lost some. Notice the Declaration of Geneva starts to get a little squishy. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life from the time of its conception. Even under threat, I will not use my medical knowledge contrary to the laws of humanity. Notice that the, priv the, uh, the pros proscription against abortion has been lost. If it's according to the laws of humanity, and if you can argue that it's respect, then it's okay. And in fact, the revision is even worse. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. Boy, where does that leave you? Well, it's more respectful to just put this guy out of his misery. So let's try a little euthanasia here. We've lost something. We really have. You know, if there's going to be abortion, why does it have to be medical people? Anyway, that's my take. Now it's your turn. Pass it up if you need to. Okay, Ariel, and we'll come here, and then we'll get Nick, and we'll go from there. I just uh, wonder to what extent this issue has become so politicized that reason is no longer in the balance. Uh, if parent or a pregnant woman can have her child uh, delivered and passed on, why does Planned Parenthood uh, seem not to encourage that but encourages abortion instead? Uh, it seems to be a mindset here that is, is, is beyond reason uh, and uh, this is affecting society as a whole. I mean, it, to me, it's, it's a very broad concern we have here that uh, we're becoming so emotionally involved in goals. Our society is so divided, and uh, the uh, contrast is getting so strong that uh, we really need to fight for, for reason and, and uh, uh, return to to uh, reality. Well, I think that there are two reasons why you have this polarization. Uh, frankly, one of them is that um, one side has a dogma that is antithetical to traditional morality, and they are intent on winning, and they don't care how. 
Um, I think that there are two reasons for that. Number one is the slippery slope is real. But the problem is that once you, once you see where it leads, there's a tendency to start to slide back up the slope. And they're afraid that once you cut loose the idea of late-term abortions being okay, even if the baby's halfway out, I think of Gosnell, they went a bridge too far. But they're afraid that it, once you, once you f cut that, then you have no place to go but all the way to the zygote. And I think that's, that's what they're afraid of, is that, that uh, abortion will not be allowed at all. But the other thing is, and I say this as somebody who lived through part of this history, I think that the destruction of abortion as an, a live option destroys the sexual revolution. And I'll explain that real briefly. Basically, the sexual revolution said, forget the old morality. What really counts is, did anybody get hurt? And because sex is good, regardless, prima facie, it feels good. Therefore, it is good. And the only problem you have is when it starts to get uh, people in trouble. So you see, but, but once you get a baby involved, it's obvious that you're no longer talking about two people who can do whatever they want to as long as nobody else gets hurt. And at that point, the morality gets in trouble. So you have to have birth control. The problem is that no birth control is 100%, and that means you have to have the ultimate backup birth control. If you don't have that, then the objection against, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, love anybody you want as long as nobody gets hurt, uh, becomes a substantial objection that they have to deal with. And I think that's where this comes from. The word morality came up a lot. It's difficult to define morality. Some say it's whatever the culture or society says it is. As a young man, I saw an ad in the paper for a lecture on the morality of nuclear war to be held on a military base. I was quite fascinated, so I went. I had never heard the rules of war. And I can't remember them all, but one of them is you shouldn't fight a war that is not morally right. You shouldn't fight a war that you cannot win. You shouldn't use nuclear warfare when conventional warfare will suffice. You shouldn't use a curved bayonet, but be restricted to a straight bayonet. Uh, I, why I was, is that? I'm curious. I was, <laughs> I was just appalled, and I began to question and just blew the meeting to smithereens. A general stood up, shook his finger at me, and said if I was in the army, he'd certainly take care of me. I could not believe a room full of intelligent people were accepting the rules of war that this country holds. And so we come to the question of abortion. In some societies, well, think of China, where you only have one shot, and it really ought to be a boy that can take care of you in your old age. There are lots of abortions in China. Lots of girl babies are put to death. Society says that's morally right, I guess. More, the moral thing <laughs> kind of leaves me adrift. Well, my answer is that I think that there is, in fact, a morality that God approves. Which God? Your God or mine? My, well, on that I feel very much like Abe Lincoln. The important thing is not whether God is on our side, the important thing is whether we are on God's side. And I make a great deal of effort to try to ascertain the will of God 
and then stick with it. And of course, if I'm wrong, then I hope that God will let me see that. Um, but, but I think that, it, that morality is ultimately grounded in the idea that we have a creator and that he actually understands what's going on. And that, and that we do best to, if you can say, that, say it that way, follow the manual. Um, Nick and then back over. First, I want to congratulate you for having the courage to bring this up in a Sabbath school in Loma Linda where the guidelines of abortion were designed. And you know what I mean by that. I had to live through that period. I, I was in medical school. Now, if you want to succeed, I think you have to drop the subject. Did you notice how many people were here when you started? Eight people. Now we are, we are below 20. That tells you where the Adventist church, on which side the Adventist church is. So, I mean, you have a choice. Either continue dealing with the subject and become irrelevant in the Adventist community or else stick to your convictions. Now, I have several things I'd like to mention. One is you, you made reference to the fact that they could not afford to do the upgrades. Dr. Gosnell was making, if I recall, is, it's a two million uh, a so month or something Depends like on who's that. estimating, but yeah, I, think the, I think the grand jury report estimated 1.8 million. So. And he could not afford to do the upgrade so that the, in case of emergency, the, the people could get the patient out and, and save a life. Uh, the, 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 more, the more you look at it, the more obviously ridiculous that whole argument yeah. is. Now, another comment. The Guttmacher Institute is a creation of Planned Parenthood. They are related. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So the statistics are actually from their side. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that just proves the point that, uh, that they're real statistics. Yes. And another comment is re regarding the Hippocratic Oath. You stop with the Geneva Convention. I hope next time you stop with Loma Linda. The Loma Linda Physician's Oath. They deleted any reference to abortion. Well, and they replaced, excuse me, they replaced this with a word related to choice. The wish of the patient has to be respected. So I would suggest that we here in Loma Linda are on the side and have been on the side of abortion since the time when Neil Wilson publicly stated that the church is leaning toward abortion because there are too many people in the world and there's too much hunger. We are on the right, wrong side of this issue. And by the way, I did my dissertation on this topic. I have given out over a hundred copies of my book. Adventists have no interest in my book, except a dozen of people I know. And yesterday, I received a letter from an old man, 85 years old. He read my book. He wants to do something about this. But he says, I realize my time is short. I don't know how much I can do. I wrote to three ABN, and I asked them on which side they are. And Pastor Gillis said, I fought to make the church free from abortion, and I failed. In the, the, we have now advocated 
So there is some hope, but if you want to be popular, you better go back and talk about evolution and creation and forget about abortion. Uh, well, one of the points that I think I will make is that when, uh, when we medical students, when I was in medical school, uh, finished up, we did actually take an oath and it was, in fact, the Geneva Oath. And it was, in fact, the revised Geneva Oath that didn't say anything about from the moment of conception. Um, it was that revised oath that I put up that has that whole thing deleted. Um, re as far as respecting patient choice, I think that that comes in a slightly different context. And that is that we are not obligated, in fact, to put it reverse we are obligated not to uh, force patients to take treatments that they don't want. Um, I don't view that particular uh, phrase as being a, uh, something that forces one to do abortions, and I doubt that most of the medical students that, that did it with me uh, feel that. As far as, as far as what the church has been doing, I think the church has missed it. I'll just put it flat out. I think that this is one area where, so we've been so busy looking at other things, you know, um, creation, alcohol, tobacco, um, that we just look past it. And that, you know, contrary to what we usually do with most things, we've been very, very, um, we've, We have not, as a church, stood where we should have. And I think it ought to change. Now, whether I can personally do something about that or not, I don't know. I do know that there will be times when uh, it may come up in a particular area. Uh, and then I may even bring it up if I have the chance to contact somebody in high office. And if so, I will do that. If it ever comes to a vote, I know which way my vote will go. Uh, I don't have control over what the church will do. And I'm not going to hold myself to that responsibility. But I am going to hold myself to the responsibility of doing whatever I can. And that's one of the reasons we're having this Sabbath school in particular. By the way, this old man that uh, wrote to me asking for help, he said he read my book and is writing a letter. He's planning to distribute this to his friends. He said he wrote to the general conference, and I did too. But uh, he received a different answer. He received an answer from uh, Dr. Handyside. And Dr. Handyside says, I'm sorry, I wish the church would have stayed on the pro-life of this issue. So we have people in power who are, how do you say, uh, are, they feel pro-life, but they, they, uh, they cannot do very much unless we help them. Well, now one thing to keep in mind is, it's important for our own integrity for us to say the truth. Okay. It's not, uh, unless we're elected conference president or something like that, it's not in our power to flat out change what the church does. But I think that sometimes God brings things up that change what's going on. And I think the Gosnell trial is a watershed moment for all kinds of people, both in and out of the church. And one of the reasons why I s waited until now is because you can make accusations all you want to about where abortion really is leading. But until you have an actual example, it's really hard to get through to people who have bought the standard line. That's why I emphasize that this stuff is not true. It is spin. But now we can prove that it's spin. It's not just a suspicion. It's not something that they can put off by, oh, you're just wearing a tinfoil hat. 
we know that people kill babies deliberately when it comes to it. It's not hypothetical anymore. Can I so, add just one little detail? I, I have given out over a hundred copies of my book. I have two extra here. If anybody does not have access to the book, I can give it to him today at the end of this Sabbath school. I think in part we have started at the wrong spot when we say is, a, is abortion okay. It seems like we should look at the broader cultural milieu of abortion and how it started. Margaret Sanger basically wanted to have sex with any man that would slow down and have sex with her. And she, when that happens, you're going to end up have it, getting pregnant more often than you wish you did. And she needed there to be legal abortion so that she could do whatever she wanted. The second thing is, I, I think that when we talk about um, the life of the mother and uh, at the point when the abortion can be done legally, kind of misses the whole point of, don't you know how babies got started? Don't you know that what you did got yourself in this fix? And I don't believe that the large proportion of women that are getting abortion today were either raped or were in incestuous relationships. They simply did not use birth control. Yes, there are girls of 11 years old who are getting pregnant, and that's a terrible tragedy. But a 19-year-old who doesn't know about birth control in this country never went to school because it's talked about all the time. And the, and the third thing is we make abortion out as though, uh, uh, and pregnancy out as though it's the worst thing that can happen to a girl. And we don't talk very much about all the STDs that she can get that can do ravaging things to her body. And because, you know, you have the right to do whatever you want, that whatever feels good to you. So it's not just abortion. It's a whole slouching towards Gomorrah of the culture. And, in, and I agree with you. I don't think we're ever going to fix it without there being conversion or Jesus coming again. I think we're just going to continue to slouch farther down into immorality in this world. That's one of the reasons why I made the point that the abortion is really the, the backstop of the sexual revolution. You don't have that. Uh, then all of a sudden the claims that, well, it's perfectly moral as long as nobody gets hurt, falls apart. Um, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that the people who started this probably had personal interest in that particular argument. Um, go ahead. You haven't... Um mentioned RU-486, which I gather is about to become, or maybe already is, uh, readily available as, as um, candy bar in a pharmacy. It seems to me that this um, probably needs discussion because it's going to influence um, significantly what happens next. Could you comment on the availability of RU-486? Well, there, there, are, there are two points that I think should be made. Okay, one of them is that you know abortion's been known for a long time. Obviously, the Hippocratic Oath mentions it. Uh, whether you do it with a pessary, whether you do it with RU486, whether you do it with a curette, um, it's all abortion. And the harm that is done is primarily people know that this was once a living thing that could have developed into a human, and it is now dead, and they did it deliberately. And you've lost me, because I thought that what you had said was that prior to implantation, you didn't see the same moral situation. And RU486, it's my understanding, prevents implantation, and therefore falls squarely within your your, your five-day or seven-day period, at which point you don't see it as the same degree of moral problem. Well, okay, maybe I can put it this way. My understanding of RU486 is that it actually induces abortion after the fetus has become implanted. Now, 
this is obviously a difference in opinion on science, and uh, I'll have to look it up and come back to you. Now, there is the morning after pill. Are you and that, that prevents implantation. And although I think that one needs to be careful about how it is used even there because you're, uh, I don't have a particular problem with, let's say, somebody who comes up and says uh, she's raped and it's actually believable and uh, give her something to try to keep uh, the fetus from implanting. And by the way, that takes the, that takes the big argument out of, uh, well, what do you do in case of rape? I say, fine, as long as it hasn't implanted yet. Um, but RU486 itself, as I understand, was actually intended to be used, mifoprostol, if I remember correctly, uh, was intended to be used with a, uh, a prostaglandin inhibitor uh, uh, and would cause an early term abortion. Um, I, my understanding may be incorrect, but um, the, uh, there was a lecture given here on this campus actually by the developer of RU486. His name was Etienne Emile Boulieu, and uh, he um, came to campus some many years ago now, shortly after it was introduced. And at that time, and I believe it's still correct, it simply prevents implantation of the uh, fertilized ovum. Now, I do think that if you're using it to cover up a mistake, it's probably uh, it's probably not not good. Whether you want to call it moral or not, I don't know. Um, depends on the choices you're looking at. I think it. If you're using it to cover up somebody else's forcible uh, rape, and I don't have a problem with it. Um, but that's a personal choice that I'm willing to allow people to make. If, if you're talking about using it three weeks later, no, I have a problem with that. At this point, you have another human that's totally dependent on you. You have the moral responsibility to take care of it. That if that you're asking me what my opinion is, and uh, it's simply a matter of finding out what the scientific facts are, and we can deal with those. We may have to go back further. That woman thou gavest me caused me to do it. And since then, women have been taking the blame. And women, as we've seen now recently in India, uh, women are not valued. Therefore, they're treated unjustly, yes, inhumanely. Yes, and ninety-eight percent of the abortions in India are female. And so we need to we need to somehow start an education program that teaches equality of the sexes and women's rights and all of those things uh, before we'll see any diminishing of this problem. I have my doubts as to whether that's going to actually yeah, it's happen. it's not going to happen. Sort of the second coming. Let's just kill the rapists and the abortionists, and that'll take care of a lot of the problem. <laughs> Pass it. Oh, you've got yeah, it there. I'm, I don't want to take too much time. You've covered a lot of area here. Uh, if I can add a little um, to your facts, um, you mentioned, or you seem to imply that there were no um, um, statistics available for back alley abortions um, before um, before Roe v. Wade and, 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 and the hearings. I'm not sure that we have enough statistics that are reliable enough to be able to make a firm judgment. And I suspect that what statistics we do have have probably been twisted by various people. And so I'm, I'm reticent to make scientific judgments on statistics that one are sketchy and two that we don't trust. The, there are statistics by the, I think the national, you know, whatever health board uh, uh, determines these things, uh, of the number of abortions that occurred in the year before Roe versus Wade. Um, it was claimed by the, it is a common claim that tens of thousands of women will go to back alley abortions and who knows how many will die from that and so on and so forth, when in fact the actual number was somewhere around 40 uh, for the year. And that's, I mean, that's a, that's a historical fact. That's, uh, you know, whether or not you want to believe that um, from, a, from a, what should I say, from a 
a government, a government, you know, group that, that did it is one thing. But that those, those I, facts I have a hunch that there were some that were not reported. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, but but at four, the difference between forty and ten or twenty or a hundred thousand a year is is uh, significant. I would think. Well, well, when you realize that half of the babies in New York City born to some groups are, or is in some areas are aborted, you just you know something is wrong with this. Right. I, I, and I'm I'm just saying that that um, um, I can't obviously uh, from what you uh, cited in the Gosnell uh, case and so on that women are, uh, through legal abortions are dying. At That's a great right. Rate. That's so right. So the back alley tens of thousands is is an attempt to to kind of overstate the issue in order to allow the continuance of us of the lower rate of mortality which occurred which is equal to yeah. the other. I mean, what do you call Gosnell besides back alley abortion? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a main street. <laughs> it's a legal it's back alley yeah, abortion, is what it is. Yeah. Um. A, a, a couple other things. I, I don't know if you know, remember. I don't know what year you graduated, but in, I think it was 1994. The my brain is going. Mine was 77. So. Okay. Yeah, it was a little after you, but the the what I call the physician in chief um, of, of the United States uh, spoke at the commencement, uh, the graduation commencement. Surgeon general. Surgeon general. Yeah. Thank you. He spoke here, and he advocated. He asked. Um, for the medical students there to reinstate or to to order their uh, practice in the future by the um, um, Hippocratic Oath. He very much, folk, that was the focus of his entire speech there. Um, apparently, then no one took him up on it, but that was, that did occur uh, before he... Well, perhaps, perhaps the administration didn't uh, uh, have the Hippocratic Oath back into into what uh, medical students were forced to, sw or forced, well, whatever, uh, required, if you, a little more polite word, to swear. But I can tell you that a large number of, of medical students realize inside of themselves whether or not. Many of them didn't go into OBGYN because of that. Some, like my brother, went into G OBGYN but refused to do abortions. Um, my my mother is a nurse. I grew up in a medical world. Um, I passed this along to one of her friends one time, and uh, one of the physicians, and he mentioned that you know most, the majority of physicians always looked at the abortion as, as a quack, as somebody somebody evil, and I thought that was interesting. Well, anyway, it looks like it's probably still true. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you did. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you did mention, uh, uh, like I said, there's so many things I wanted to try to uh, to address. But you mentioned something uh, as part of your train of thought that so many of the arguments for the support of abortion on demand are, are, are founded, are grounded in a lie. They're all lies. And the very, one of the very um, Th beginning... That, that doesn't mean everybody who uses them is lying. Right, exactly. I'm not saying that. But yeah. the argument itself was, was a lie and, you know, people... Uh, uh, the Lord says one of the principles of being lost and saved is if when you know the truth and you choose not to believe it, you will be given over to believe a lie. So a lot of people conscientiously believe the lie because they don't want to believe the truth. And here There's we are There's some today. of that too. And the entire uh, uh, Roe versus Wade, very few people know anything about the legalities of, of Roe versus Wade and, and Doe v. Bolton. They know that it exists, but they know very little about it. Um, uh, both, both laws overturned existing anti-abortion laws that were passed in the, in the period which was, happened to coincide with the heart of Ellen White's ministry between the 1840s and, uh, and, the, 19, and the early, very, very early 1900s. They were all state laws passed then, and e every one of them, as far as I've been able to uh, document, every single one of them, including the Texas law, Texas law or the Georgia law that was overturned in Roe v. Wade, um, also made provision for the life of the mother. That was always a part of every abortion law. There, th that wasn't even a question. What, the, what Roe v. Wade and uh, Do uh, Bolton did was that they'd simply open the doors to all kinds of other different reasons for any reason. You know, the, uh, I'll be devastated if I have another girl. Yeah, <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Um, but the the very cases themselves were taken before the Supreme Court based on lies. 
they misportrayed the cases of um, Doe, Jane Doe, and, um, and they, they misrepresented the actual situation in order to accomplish legally what they wanted to accomplish. And both Norma McCorvey, who was Jane Roe, and I can't remember the, uh, who um, um, the, uh, the other one was. Anyway, they have both become pro-life and have come out and said, hey, that wasn't what we, that wasn't our situation. Had we known, we would have been much more reluctant to let them use us as a case study before the Supreme Court. So yeah. I just wanted to uh, pass on a couple of... Uh, uh, no, it's, it's true. The, the, the Supreme Court decision has, uh, I think, been justifiably uh, compared with uh, uh, the Dred Scott decision. And then uh, a couple more things, and, and I'll, I'm trying not to dominate because I want to let go. Um, our church has been acti actually actively involved in promoting abortion, all the way from the, um, uh, uh, our top leadership at one time, our religious liberty department, at our medical school, uh, not medical schools, our medical institutions, um, the, the most prolific abortionist in the country, if not the world, was trained at Loma Linda University, opened a series of abortion, the most successful abortion clinics in the, in the country, made was millions of dollars, and has, a, and, has a, um, and has his name written on one of our uh, top uh, college institutions as, as um, well, La Sierra named one of their, their yes. programs after yes. him. So we have been complicit in the abortion industry. So it's not, like, um, it's not like we can say, well, it's one of those things we're really not active. And I have a, I'm not going to go in. I, I have documentation of the things that I'm, uh, I kept these over the years to make yeah. sure that nobody would say, oh, that didn't happen. Uh, my last point would be, and I'm, I'm out of here then. <laughs> um, a lot of times we, we start arguing about, are you 486 and are you not 486, whichever one. We, but uh, I think it was uh, Samuel Clemens that once said, hey, I'm not so much concerned about the mysteries of God. What really worries me is the things that I know about God. And I apply that principle uh, to this debate. What happens before a woman knows she's pregnant is... 99% uh, of, of, of the issue here. And I think that maybe we get sidetracked a little too much of time. When exactly does life start as compared to we know life is here, therefore what can we do about it? Oh, okay. I'm going to go all around okay. at it. Forgive me, but uh, this is so close to my heart because I spent so many years crying and praying and fasting. I've been asking God to send workers to his vineyard on this issue. But I wanted to add that there is on the internet a, a page entitled Confession of Dr., if I recall correctly, Bernardson. And he became pro-life, but he was the instrument of the pro-abortionist in preparing the attitude of the people to accept legal abortions. And he says, we use deception. He says, when the number of illegal abortions were small, we succeeded in making people believe that there were a million abortions a year, illegal abortions a year. We used deception if we succeeded and prepared the way for the legalization of abortion. But I want to add something else. Adventists, we Adventists, led the way for the abortion to become legal because we allowed our Castle Memorial Hospital back in 1970 to start offering abortions on demand in violation of our own principles. 
Well, and the, the reason is very simple. This morning on, uh, on the discussion, search, searching for answers, they made reference not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What happened at the Castle Memorial Hospital is that half of the physicians were non-Adventists, they wanted abortion, they demanded abortion, and they threatened to take their patients to other hospitals if they refused the right to offer abortions on demand. The Adventist physician says, no way. And who prevailed? Take a guess. So well, we led the way. Three years before abortion was legalized, we led the, led the way. Then I, th I think it's not fair to say we led the way. We did. No. I'm I, sorry. I, 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 no. Uh, if, if the Adventists as a group were against it and the non-Adventists were for it, then you can't say we led the way in that instance. You just can't. We look the other way. Well, now, now, whether some other people look the other way is a different question. But saying that we led the way is being totally unfair to the church. And I think that you should be very careful about what you say in those instances. Thank you for your advice. But I stand by, wo by what I said because I investigated much more deeply than you did. Uh, no, I, you, just, I you just gave me the information that needed to be there. The Adventist physicians didn't want to, the non-Adventist physicians did, the non-Adventists prevailed. You can't say the Adventists led the way. That's just logic. It's not logic because Neil Wilson sided with the non-Adventist physicians now, and we looked the other way and allowed them to prevail. No, just a minute. Neil Wilson versus Adventist physician doesn't say Adventist led the way. Now I understand that you have a lot of animus in this area and I don't blame you. The church has been derelict in its duty. But let's be really careful about blaming our church for everything that's going on. When in fact there are people in our church, you know, Elijah had this problem once. The leader of Israel was taking Israel in the wrong direction and, and God said, look, I got 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee. You think you're alone, you're not. And when we paint everything with a broad sweeping brush, we're in trouble. Now don't get me wrong, I think that the official church position needs to be reversed. But I think you need to be really careful about saying that everything is going to pot and nobody really cares. I didn't say that. Actually, let me tell you, my study revealed that when, when uh, Loma Linda prepared the guidelines of abortion, two-thirds of Adventists, those Adventists who who expressed their opinion on abortion were on the pro-life side. But who prevailed? Liberal Adventists. And, and the reason why they prevailed is okay. very, very simple. Okay. They, they had arguments that sounded good yeah. and that sounded like tearjerkers, like the ones about uh, well, what do you do if a woman is raped? What do you do if a woman has a baby that can't possibly survive anyway? And then, of course, just generalize it to everybody. And see, that's a dishonest argument. It's a fundamentally dishonest argument. Um, and I'm, I'm going to label it that. But there are a lot of people who didn't know you know, they knew it was wrong somehow, but they couldn't really put their finger on exactly why. Or perhaps they couldn't really figure out what could be done to change the situation. And there were some people in power who did have the ability to change the situation and who either got fooled by the arguments or um, wanted to accept the arguments when they uh, had ulterior motives and that's for God to judge as to what they were doing. Let me but my, my point is this, we are coming into a new era. We need to take advantage of it and we need to be really careful about 
fighting other people who may in fact be on our side. Because if we, if we try to pretend that everybody else is against us, look, I don't know, maybe I'll lose the whole Sabbath school. But I'm not going to start out assuming that. Uh, I would like to clarify that... Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to give somebody else the chance okay. to talk. All right. What do we do? Um, it was referenced that a certain uh, Adventist doctor was a great abortionist. He also is very wealthy. And through the years, in the committees I attended, his name would come up as a potential donor, one we should contact. I always stood and said, if we contact him, it should be about the condition of his soul, not the, the value of his purse. I was a total failure every time, every time. The money, the money speaks. And even though I hear today he's repented, and I'm certainly happy if he has, I am, <laughs> I guess, a bit of a skeptic being around repentance as long as I have. But Castle Valley, losing patience, they needed to, to do abortions to stay in business. I don't think so. Catholic Church hospitals have done fairly well uh, without that. But uh, the money is a tainting factor in this. Uh, I will agree. Uh, I will concede what you said. You are right in saying that the majority of Adventists did not lead the way to abortion. What I meant, and maybe we can agree on this, that the, those, that those people, those Adventists who had the power to stop this madness did not do it. So those leaders were the ones who are responsible in leading in the wrong direction. And so you are right. That I will agree with. Okay. I, I think I'm, glad, I, <laughs> I'm glad that we agree on that. And, and I think uh, well, we're going to give... No, go, let her go first. Uh, you first, and then you, and then I think we'll quit. Okay. This is something that I just listened to this morning as I was listening through the Word of Promise on a CD. Uh, and I think it's kind of apropos here because I believe that God believes in freedom so much that he lets us do whatever we want. Here's what uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 15 says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his word, scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of God arose against his people till there was no remedy. I think God is patient with us, and he works with us, and it's up to us as individuals and corporately to make the right decisions. And if, but if we don't, he'll give us up. I am. Second, uh, Second Chronicles 36, 15 and 16. It, it's a summary, if I remember correctly, of the entire monarchical period yes. to where the... Uh, uh, to where finally, uh, during the reign of Jehoiakim and then later of Zedekiah, uh, Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. basically cleaned house yeah. on. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. I am. Um, I, I, Nick and I have, have a lot in common. We do disagree on motive of, of the church's decision. And I, I've spent a lot of time, I was a part of that. I was uh, actively watching what would happen and writing letters and so on and so forth. And. Uh, and it was a time in Adventism that was, I, I think, somewhat unique, kind of a, a complex time. And it's interesting to me that the issue is not a divide between liberal and conservative. Um, otherwise, I could attribute it to between liberal, but very conservative um, uh, Adventist leaders were, were pro-choice, and very liberal <laughs> Adventist people were pro-life. 
it, it, it's, it's a very complex, it, it, was a, it really wasn't complex, but I mean, the, the, the dynamic in Adventism at the time made for strange bedfellows, uh, is all I can say. The, um, the, the rise and, and, uh, of the political aspect of it by the, by the religious right, um, combined with all the lies and everything that were going on, uh, the, the supposed threat from the religious right of imposing their morality scared a lot of Adventists into supporting... And, and scared the conservatives worse. Concert, the, the, concert the conservatives, um, and, and yeah, like you said, I think you're right, uh, scared the conservatives worse. So I attribute, my own, my own opinion is that I attribute where we're at now is just the fact that we did not seek to find God's will at all costs. That we were just more intent on avoiding losing your class by not standing up for what's right. There was a lot, a lot to do that. And I really uh, I like what you just said that, I'll kind of paraphrase it, maybe God is giving us a second chance. Maybe that's, maybe a second opportunity like he did with Israel. Maybe another opportunity is coming around. We, it is a different time, it is a different era. We're seeing the fruition of our choices of 30 years ago. And, and now, I, I think we should take full advantage of it. Yes. I, I, I appreciate that. Okay. See you next week then. <laughs>